Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. We're going to welcome in the worship with the blowing of the shofar. <coughs> And if everyone will read with me.
Gillian and Cynthia will be lighting Shabbos candles.
and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Upon these two commandments and all the law and the prophets. Amen. Amen. This is the blessing before the Torah reading. Baruch Hu at Adonai Hamamurach. Baruch at Adonai Hamamurach. Prophet 
Nathan thought it a good idea and told David to do all that is in your heart for the Lord is with you. But Nathan had only assumed God would allow David to build him a house. When God said no, Nathan had to go back to David and change his advice. David would not build God's house, but the prophecy Nathan delivered to him was that from David's offspring, the Messiah would come. Now we go to Acts 10, chapter 9, verse 22. Oh, chapter, okay, I mixed that up. Chapter 10, 9 through 22, and 34 and 35. Here we have tradition versus doctrine. The early, early church was all Jews. Jews believed that Gentiles could not be saved unless they first became proselytized into the Jewish faith. Cornelius the Gentile, a centurion in the Italian regiment, was a devout man who feared God and taught his entire household to do so. He gave alms generously and prayed to God without ceasing. Cornelius wanted to know more of God. In a vision, God told Cornelius to send for Peter. God chose Peter to instruct Cornelius of all the things commanded of him by God. In a vision to Peter, God made it very plain that what he God had cleansed, Peter must not call common or unclean. God also told Peter to go with the men Cornelius sent. When Peter arrived at the home of Cornelius, he found Cornelius and all his family eager to hear all the things God had commanded. Peter learned that God shows no partiality. Everyone who fears God and works righteousness is accepted by him. It doesn't matter who you are or where you are from. If you sincerely seek God with all your heart, you will be accepted by him. Cornelius and Peter did all the things that God commanded of them, and the Gentile church was born. Thank you, Good job. I really appreciate you. Bethany is going to do the closing prayer. Baruch atah Eloheinu melech haolam Asher natan lanu et oitin bat Dekaye olam natan bitukenu Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu atorah Amen Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the Universe, who has given us the Torah of Truth and planted within us eternal life. Blessed are you, Adonai, giver of the Torah. Thank you, Bethany. Yapa is going to be teaching us tonight. Yapa is an amazing teacher. She puts her heart and soul into everything that she presents. She's going to be blessing us tonight with a walk through the Tanakh. Uh, she did say it might be a run through the Tanakh. <laughs> Thank you. And um, my um, extremely wonderful assistant, uh, I threw her last minute on the job. So um, between the two of us, we'll be walking through. Now, um, you remember the first half? I'm going to review a little bit. And we're going to start where God started it, and at the very beginning, he, um, he used his words, there's nothing in my hands, and the very beginning starts with creation, and Adam and Eve disobeyed, so they fell. Now, things didn't go too much better uh, for a long time. God gave until the 10th generation, and then finally, 
He sends a flood. Very good. There's our Genesis. That's our first book of the Bible. And then after the flood, we have disobeying again. And so after the Tower of Babel, God changes their language and they all spread out into nations. And then 4,000 years ago, approximately, God spoke to Abraham. And Abraham was to leave Ur, the city of Ur. I'm pointing out here because I gave, like you're sitting on a map, I gave points where you were sitting. And uh, there's a Persian Gulf back there. And, uh, ooh, that tastes like salt. Sarah, Abraham, Lot, and Terah, the four people that left Ur. And they had to travel by the Tigris. And when you see a tiger, you're Euphrates. So we have the two rivers of the Tigris and the Euphrates. And they came to Haran where Ta Terah dies. Terah is Abraham's father. And God speaks to him, tells him to keep going. And he ends up in Israel. I make a capital I. Now the one thing about the walk through the, uh, and I'm doing as quick as I can a run through, is that I'm giving you hand signs as I go along. So I'm going to um, quickly, creation, fall, flood, nations, 4,000 years, Ur, Persian Gulf, ooh, Saul, Sarah, Abraham, Lot, Terah, Tigris, Euphrates, Haran, Terah dies. There's the uh, Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River, and the Dead Sea. And um, so um, Israel is the name of the land, and uh, Abraham had Ishmael and Isaac. Both begin with I, and Isaac had two sons. You have the hairy skin, which was Jacob, and then the smooth one was Thank you very much. Isaac had two sons, a set of twins. The first one was Esau, and the second one was Jacob. Jacob was a very smooth operator, and so we pat our skin and remembered that he was a smooth operator. But he ends up being a very big blessing. So we have um, Ishmael, Isaac. Isaac has two sons, and his Isaac's two sons are Esau and Jacob. Jacob um, has 12 sons, but we're going to remember the one with the pretty coat. Um, he is named Joseph, and he's going to end over in Egypt, and all of the Jewish people are going to end up in Egypt, and... So we end the first book. If you'll notice in the thing, there's a big N. So all of my overheads of the books, which we're about to go to the next book, um, the, this one, the N, is the way that we remember the big N. Um, all of that book of Genesis is all about beginnings, beginning of the world, beginning of family, beginning of a nation. And so there's 400 years and then a pharaoh who forgets all about Joseph. And so we start our, our book of 400 years of bondage. And then grab that staff. Moses. He goes to Pharaoh and he says, let my people go. And the pharaoh says, no. Well, God says, ten, sends 10 visual aids. And the last one, they hitchhike out of town, thank you, and the people end up in the desert. They go to the mountain where Moses tells God, oh, they're giving me a headache. He says, here, take these two tablets. You'll be fine. So in any case, he gets the two tablets, and he goes down and uh, to the mountain, and they are the law. And he also has the pattern of the tabernacle. And so now we're ready for our next book, which is going to be the people inside the tabernacle are the Levites and priests. And they're going to teach everybody about the offerings and feasts. And see at the very bottom there, offerings and feasts. Now, it's a little hard to see because my computer didn't show you, 
but he's got an L on his belt there because he's got the right genes. He's a Levite, and that whole book of Leviticus is all about the plate of money and the food, which is known as the offerings and feasts. Do you see the man kissing the toe? So we know that book is the left toe kiss. Uh, yeah, any case, there's more of those. Uh, left toe kiss, and then from there, um, they got the tabernacle, and they're going to keep traveling, and they come to a place called um, Kadesh Barnea, where it's a bunch of palm trees, and they're going to send out 12 spies. Unfortunately, 10 of them, the majority come back with a bad report, but Joshua and Caleb say, oh no, we can do it, we can do it. And um, unfortunately, because of the 12 spies, they're going to do the next book, and do you see my, what's the book? Numbers! See, all of the numbers are wandering in the desert, and they're going to wander around until the uh, generation of 20 and, and older die, and then we're ready for Moses is going to give some sermons. And do you see my two little men? They're singing, and they're singing a duet, Running on Me. Fortunately, it's not me personally. Uh, they're running, and you see the second law on their chest there, because Moses is going to teach the law a second time. So that's where I ended up at the last time I was here. He went up to the mountains, and Moses dies, and the whole book, at the end of there, after he's done, he's done, they're ready to go across, and so we're starting with the next book, and I make for the general... Joshua! He's the head of the army. There's only going to be one battle he loses. And as the theme of our Parsha tonight, people disobey again. And so they lose, and the rest of all the battles they'll win. But once they go across, they're going to go across the Jordan, and they're going to come to that city where all the walls are going to fall down, and we say, Jericho. And then they're going to divide and conquer. And we don't have the next book up there yet. So <laughs> the next book, keep going down, and you'll find a general. And he's crushing all of them. There we go. There he is. That's Joshua. And he's crushing all of the uh, enemy. And you are sitting in the south. Up here is the north on our map. They're going to divide and settle. And the whole tribes are going to divide up the land. <coughs> and now we're ready for the one underneath. It's the book of Judges. Very good. I'm glad you're helping me out here. You can see a small number seven on the uh, cycle because this is cycles. Judges are just going to be a bunch of cycles. They're going to obey God, they're going to be blessed, but then they're going to get complacent, and the next thing you know, they're going to fall in sin, worship the idols, or do their own thing instead of doing it what God wants, and then the enemy comes in and destroys them, conquers them, they cry out to God, God sends a Savior, and everything's wonderful again. And then after a little while, they get complacent again, and it goes over and over. Our very first judge that I want to talk about, there are several judges. It's going to last 400 years of time. The book of Judges, like a ballad in your, your hand. Okay, so the first one is my hair, Deborah. And she's going to tell the head of the military that he needs to do go go defeat the, the enemy, and he's afraid. He goes, I won't go unless you go with me. Well, because he does that, he misses out on the big blessing and, get, and the honor. And a woman gets the credit for the defeat of the battle. We have to obey and do it God's way, as we heard in our Torah portion tonight. And then the next person that was a very important judge was Gideon, and I'm ripping out my fleece because he wasn't sure it was God that was speaking to him, and he said, oh, wait a minute, make all of the ground wet and the fleece dry. Well, that worked, so he said, let me do it the other way. Make the fleece wet 
and the ground dry. He gets up in the morning, and it's that way. He brings out the water. Okay, it's you, God. But one of the things besides finding out for sure he's being led by God that happens next is that he gets a huge army, 30,000 men, and God whittles it down to 300 because no man's going to get the glory of what God is going to do. Plus, what are they going to take to battle? They're going to take a lantern, which is shining light. They're going to take the shofars, and they're going to take the lamp. And they're going to crush the lamp. They're going to shout praises, and they're going to blow the shofar. Not a weapon, only spiritual weapons of the light and their praising. An enemy is confused among themselves. These are things I pray an awful lot in today's world, that the enemy de be defeated by confusion and run away from battle, and especially in this day. These things that we're reading about and learning about in the Bible are for instructions for us. The Torah is not just law. It has some laws in it, but the main book is instructions. And if we will learn the lessons of what other people did, we won't have to have some of the falls. We'll have a smoother path. They didn't have a Bible to read like we do. And so Gideon obeys. The enemy is dispersed. And the very last judge, very important one, brings down the house. He, again, is into doing his own thing, and he has sexual sin and other things that he did wrong. He did stay pure to God. And at the end, his hair grows back, he gets his strength back, which is his hair growing is a symbol of it, and he prays to God and asks, may he be an instrument of defeating the enemy. And he dies, but yet... He did return to God, and no matter what we've done in our lives, call back on God immediately. And if not, as soon as you wake up, <laughs> when you're tired of being hurt, when you're tired of whatever you're going through, call out to God. He's just waiting for you to call to Him. And so we have the main thing of the whole book is that everyone did what was right, in their own eyes, except Ruth and Samuel. The very same time that Judges is happening, Ruth's book is happening, Naomi and her husband are leaving the Holy Land, and, uh, Jerusalem, I believe, is their city, and their two sons end up marrying people from the uh, foreign country. Well, after the husband dies, the sons die, and Naomi's going to go back. But she has these two daughter-in-laws. One goes back to the family, but Ruth says, no, I'm going with you. Your God is going to be my God, your people, my people. And today there's many people that are saying that today. All of us here in this room, as far as I know, we're following the one true God and saying, you're my God, and I choose to follow you. There's one other main thing that happens in this book, Kidsman Redeemer. Jesus is our Kidsman Redeemer. He's the one that accepts us in, and we're looking forward to that wedding soon. It's coming very soon. But the Kidsman Redeemer is a very wonderful story. I don't have time for it, but <laughs> we're going to run on to the next book um, and not do everything that's right in our own eyes, but what is right in God's eyes. And so our next book is, what has he got his foot on? Does anybody know what that animal is? And it doesn't begin with an A, it begins with a D. Donkey. Donkey. And it's made out of sand. So the book is one sand donkey. Oh, I said donkey. Mule. Mule. Oh, I was so excited I got it mixed up. Okay. So one Samuel. And the king is got a saw in his hand, so the king is Saul. At this time Israel is united. It's only gonna last hundred and twenty.
20 years, but they've insisted on having a king. And this king, you see that big line across? He has no heart for God. So that's why his heart is no heart for God. He's the first king. He rules 40 years. But the second king in our two Samuels has a heart. And his name is David. David. Now, what I really like about these pictures is when I'm trying to think of, where's it talk about Saul? 1 Samuel, right? Where does it talk about David? 2 Samuel. It's a visual that helps me remember what's going on in this book. So in 2 Samuel, we have the life of David. The book of Kings is all written from the kings and the history perspective. But he has a whole heart for God. See, that heart is nice and red. And even God says that he's a man after his own heart. He is a man that sinned, but yet he came back and repented when, it, when he was made aware that, yeah, God knows what you did, not when you did, I mean, when you did it, and when you tell him about it, it's not when he finds out. God knows the very beginning. So go to him right away if you've got something that you need to talk to him about. He's waiting because he wants to make that time of sorrow short. So you have uh, King David in 2 Samuel, and our next king, you see the number one on his crown, so we know he's a king, So, and, he, and he's got a whole bunch of people behind him, they're singing, and he's got a solo, so he's a solo man, and it's first king. You see that bag in his hands? The kingdom is going to be split, as that bag is, over taxes, kind of what's happening in the world. But he's going to uh, reign as king, but it's his son who will decide to raise the taxes so high that the kingdom is now going to be split. So it only each king, 40 years, 120 together, now we're going to have a divided kingdom. And um, we come to the next one is missing. It's an exile, and I'll, I'll get there you. Hold on. Um, the next missing one is, is, oh, I'm jumping ahead. Okay. This next book is Daily Chronicles, and uh, that's about David. So with 1 Kings, I was looking for 2 Kings. I was wondering, yeah, I'm right. The, the Second Kings is missing for some reason. Okay, so now we're into 1 Chronicles. And as I said, there's two perspectives. We have 1 Kings that is written from an earthly perspective, and the Chronicles is written by the priest. And so they're going to write all about David and say what happened from their perspective. And the next one, if you go scrolling down some more, then we're going to have our exile here. Oh, there it is. It's no, it's not in there. Okay, I'll have to be on my own. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, the next thing is the Second Chronicles is uh, an exile in that they're exiled from the land of Israel. And I apologize for the mistake with the overheads. Um, I just didn't find the right uh, computer program. Okay, so the the kingdom is going to be divided after Solomon dies and his son raises taxes. And so we're going to have a divided kingdom. And I said this is the north and that's the south. Well, up here in the north, they're going to call all of this Israel. There's going to be ten tribes. And where you're sitting, only two tribes. You're going to be Judea. You have the temple. So what do they do up here in the north? They make a golden calf. Immediately, the, the king that takes the kingdom away from the rightful uh, king is going to uh, make golden calves for everybody to worship. So they won't go down there to the temple 
and he'll lose some of his people and uh, some of their money too because you're supposed to go and give your offerings. But that's unfortunate because they're going to be the first part that are going to be conquered because they get into idolatry right away. And so we have three kingdoms that come along. You have Assyria who captures all of Israel up here, the ten tribes, and they scatter them all around. First of all, you've got a uh, few here, maybe in France, and some over here in, in Italy, and, and, and then they take some people from the different countries and put them in here. What ends up happening in the northern part is that we get the the um, Nazareth. Nazareth, no. Oh, the the ones that that they the Samaritans. They don't like the Samaritans because they're not full-blooded Jewish anymore after the exile. Uh, later in history, there's an animosity between the two because of the mixed blood, and that all happened because of the exile. Uh, and the Assyrians capturing them. Well, Assyria's only going to last so many years, and the next kingdom that's going to happen, that's going to come in, they're going to capture all of Judea, and they're going to take implements away from the temple and bring them back to Babylon. Now, in Babylon, they've scooped up the best of all of the Jewish boys, Daniel and his friends, they've taken them to Babylon, and they're there for 70 years. And one of the things that we learned about why 70 years is because of the Sabbath. This year is a Sabbath year. What a blessing God is providing for us. Um, and so after 70 years, then you have Persia is going to capture the people in Babylon. And so the majority of people are going to end up in Persia. Now we have a very beautiful queen that we just talked about just what a week ago I think it was, and uh, that queen is going to be Esther, and I have a beautiful slide somewhere that's not here in front of us, that uh, we have this queen stirring an S, and she's sitting on a Persian rug with a Persian cat, and um, she went to the king, and she offered I don't think, um, oh good, let's, let's, there she is. Um, so Esther, after three days of prayer, goes before the king. She could have been killed, but God protected her, and she helped save her people. It was all God doing it, using people who were willing, because her uncle told her when she was afraid to go, who knows, but for such a time as this, that might be why you are here, why you are the queen. I say that to each of us, to myself and to each of us. For such a time as this, each of us are here today. In this world, whatever we can do, whatever God shows you to do, do it. It's so important to be aware they used a little boy to multiply fish, to feed a crowd. He used her, even though she might have died by going in, in somewhere where she wasn't supposed to, and the king gave her favor, because God's with you. He tells you to do it. For such a time as this, be strong, stand up. We are having a tremendous amount of persecution in the world of faith, even up in Canada. There's pastors being thrown in jail because they're having church service. There's things happening in America, too. So please, be prayed up and be ready to go when God tells you to do something. He'll give you the, the strength and the favor that you need. So we have Esther. So let's go back to that Esra. And um, they're in Persia, and we have a king, after Circe is gone, that sends the people back to Jerusalem. I'm going to end with him, with the wall. One more up. The, the one up there with the wall, that's an Es, S. 
Ra. Ezra. Ezra. <laughs> S is saying Ra. So we have Ezra. He's going to teach the people. And then um, we have one that's teaching the people. And we have one that is going to teach them about the Zerubbabel. He is going to teach them how to build the temple and how to obey the laws. Because when they were in captivity, they didn't have the Torah read to them and they didn't know some of the laws. And they had to reestablish with the people how to live. I think that's happening in America because we don't have the Bible in, in our schools anymore. We definitely have to reestablish morals, reestablish the Word of God in people's lives. And so um, one of the things I'm going to backtrack just a tiny bit is that in the North, they had 19 kings. In the South, they had 20. Up here, they had zero good kings. Why? Their foundation was the false gods. And then the South, in the 400 years of them, uh, before they were taken away, they had eight. Huh? Eight out of 20, at least they had a few good ones. Um, you know, leadership, it's really important to pray for who our leaders are. That God will turn their hearts that we can have good leadership. And also, um, I did tell you that Solomon had a half a heart. Part of the time he believed God, some of the times he did his own thing. He wasn't supposed to have a thousand wives, but he did. He wasn't supposed to go to Egypt and have a whole bunch of horses and chariots and things, but he did. He didn't always obey. He did build the temple, and he did do a lot for the Lord, but it was only a half a heart. Um, I also skipped the, the time of the kings after the division and before they're taken away. Uh, there's another 400 years. And during that time of the bad kings and a few good ones in Jerusalem, the prophets have been speaking, telling them to ship up or they're going to get shipped out. Shape up. Thank you. <laughs> Shape up or ship out. He must have done this before. <laughs> but if they don't shape up is to learn the word of God, they're going to be removed. And they obviously didn't shape up. They didn't do what they were supposed to. And they were shipped out. Um, okay, so we get back to Assyria uh, scatters them and Babylonia scoops up the best. Um, and then they get to go to Persia, and their captivity is 70 years. So Rebel is going to help teach them about the temple and the laws of how to obey God. Um, Esther has helped save them. And Ezra is going to uh, do his thing of teaching them. And then we get to Nehemiah. Nehemiah is the one we, we say, Nehi Nehemiah. And he's going to build the walls. He had a tremendous amount of opposition. Even though the king was for him, there was people lying about him, making up things. They got to the point, they're building those walls. One person had to have a weapon, and the other person worked. And everybody worked in the area where they lived. What a lesson to us. Work in the kingdom of God where you are living, where God has placed you. Amen. God will move you when it's his timing, but in the meantime, work for him where you are, building the walls of the kingdom together and keeping those weapons of the Lord handy. And God will lead you. And so there's another 400 years after all of the prophets. Um, I say, uh... So that book is Isaiah. <laughs> um, I really enjoy my books. You can see the one there with the filthy rags. He's holding up the rag. And um, the very top with all the watches. He's talking about uh, be a watchman. <laughs> it's a beautiful 
uh, program when I have more time to show you more of the pictures. And um, Joel with the uh, with the locusts, there's going to be restoration. There were so many prophecies. This one underneath there, the Micah. Micah is talking to the judge about the Son, uh, the Son of God. There are so many prophecies in the writings of the minor prophets. Um, but what happens after Malachi, if you can find Malachi, um, Ezekiel there and Obadiah, um, and then Daniel has the lion's den, um, Haggai, he's hugging a capital I. There we are, Malachi, a mallet hitting a rock of stone, a, a heart of stone. What it says in Malachi, the very end there, it says, I will take out your stony heart and give you a heart of flesh. God has done that through Yeshua, but sometimes I think he has to do it for me every morning. <laughs> or maybe every night, whatever. I, I go to him and thank him for correction and direction in my life. And he gives us a circumcised heart take out that stony heart. There's 400 years of silence and then God sends Christ. During those 400 years, God was very active preparing things for the right time when Yeshua would come. So, know that even though we may not see him like in the book of Esther and in those 400 years of silence, he's very active. God bless you. Thank you for this. Yeah. That walkthrough has me out of breath. I don't know about you. <laughs> you can tell she's a teacher, right? She brought it down to our level. And made it fun. What a fun walk through the Old Testament. Thank you so much for that. She always has novel ways of demonstrating things. And did you do the artwork on all those slides? Oh no. Oh. It's a walk through the Bible. Oh, there's actually a program. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. So maybe we can think of those pictures so we can remember where things are. I don't know. I need all kinds of help remembering things. So now we're going to do the announcements. Okay. Are we ready? Okay. Passover is just around the corner. Now I'm going to use your signs. Just around the corner. April 15th. We're having our last rehearsal on April 2nd. You need to have your money in by April 2nd. We will be collecting tonight. If anybody has a check, we thank you. We're very excited. And for those who are not going to be dancing, it's okay, especially the 12 men, if any of the 12 men won't be dancing, you come anyway because we need to know the order of things. We need to at least be able to march in. If you have your own talus and yarmulke, please bring those. We will have extra. And I think it's important if anybody's involved in the program to be there for the final thing to walk through. So, uh, so show up, show up on time. I'm not sure yet, but I will send an announcement. I know it's Saturday, April 2nd. It's either at 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock because the people coming from Ohak Shalom, they stay afterwards for an opening just like we do. And so sometimes they don't get out of there right at 12 or 1, so I can carry on. So Barbara and Jack, who are going to be training us and walking us through, we have to wait for them to get to us. But I will send out an announcement so you know. It's going to be a wonderful, wonderful evening. We're all excited to have you participate. We thank you for those that have volunteered to participate. And um, I know it's always uplifting and fun. It doesn't matter if you're a good dancer, bad dancer, as long as you go in the same direction everybody else is so you don't trip somebody up, right? Right? So so it's okay. Join us. 
Um, what else? A forty dollars for adults, fifteen dollars for children, twelve and under. Uh, April twelfth, we're going to have the Rush Kodesh, which is right before that. Uh, are you? Is that April second? Sorry, April second. Same day, as Same day as the practice, so it's going to be a busy day. So we can go right from practice over to Rosh Kodesh. Are you guys going to be doing it? <laughs> yeah, I think I'll, I'll talk you talk to yeah. You let us know if we're going to be meeting. That's, that's a busy day, a really busy day. Actually, going back to Passover, we encourage those of you that are participating to be there no later than 4:30, the day of the Passover. We start promptly at 5.30. If you're not there, you're not there. So we really encourage you to be there on time. Parking could be an issue because there should be, I don't know, anywhere from 40 to 50 people. So the parking line will probably be not quite full, but um, it'll be pretty full. So please get there on time. Those of you that are volunteering, helping put it together, we need you there at the fellowship hall 10 o'clock that day, 10 o'clock. April 15th, Saturday morning, I'm sorry, Friday morning, April 15th. We need you there at 10. We should be done by noon, depending upon how many volunteers we have to put everything together. So I'm in the background getting everything ready. You will get your books. Those of you that are the 12 men, I'm working on that. I have the 12 books. Now I have to go through it and see who's saying what. So I will get you your books and plenty of time for you to rehearse on your own. If you have any questions, just give me a call or Barry a call and we'll walk you through it. Anything else? I don't think we have anything. Yeah, I guess that's it for now. That's the big rock. And yes, did you? What time was set up? What time is the what? The set up? Set up 10 o'clock. So please be there at 10. I'm sure we'll be done by noon because some of the tables are already set up. And uh, so we just have to put chair covers on, tablecloths on. And uh, I'm going to talk to the caterer about being there about an hour early because we have to do the Seder plates as well. They always bring the elements for the Seder plates. We put them together and get everything out on the table. And so hopefully, like clockwork, everything will be done on time. Please, God. Okay, so I think that's all I have to say. We will have the ironic benediction from my one-armed bandit over here, my rabbi, my husband, my friend, Dr. Barry Graham. Thank you. Thank you again, Judy. Nice job. Great job, Yafa. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face smile down upon you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace. In the name of our Prince of Peace, our Sar Shalom, Yeshua HaMashiach, be blessed. Amen. And cut. Shabbat 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 Shabbat